We took a few weeks off, but we're back now in our verse-by-verse study through the book of Romans. And it's always difficult to know what, what pace you should take when you teach through a book. Should you go very slow and look to, to bring out the glory of the fullness of it? You know, in some ways, the, the, the Bible is like a beach, and it's got millions of grains of sand on it. And it's great to look at the whole beach, but you could take one grain of sand and put it under the microscope, and, and there's enough for you to think about on one grain of sand. Well, we're, we're trying to look at a little more of the beach at each individual message. We're going through maybe a, a, a bit more rapidly than, than we might otherwise, because we want to catch more of the whole flow of the book. And so this morning, we're taking a look at the first 29 verses of Romans chapter 9. It's a big section, but I think you'll see how the, how the thought stays the same through the whole passage. Now, you should know that there's a real shift in focus between the first eight chapters of the book of Romans and the second eight chapters. Let me show you how Romans chapter 8 ended. Look there with me. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 37. Paul says, Yet in all these things we're more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, if that doesn't hit you, you should check your pulse to see if you're still alive. That's just, that's just a glorious declaration of faith that Paul has. That there's nothing in heaven or in earth, visible or invisible, anything that can keep us from the love of God, or should I say, can keep the love of God from us. But it's different when we come into chapter 9. You see, all through the first eight chapters, Paul thoroughly convinced us about man's need and God's glorious provision through Jesus and through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul wants to answer a question that might have been nagging some of his readers or might be nagging you, even though you haven't been able to articulate it. You see, you end Romans chapter 8, and you go, oh God, you're so good to me. This is great. You make so many promises, and they're all great, and they're all good, and you love me so much, and you have such a great purpose for me. And Lord, your love is so magnificent, but it might be in the back of somebody's mind. Well, didn't you used to love Israel that way? Didn't they used to be your special people, your chosen people? And look at them now. Especially in Paul's day, the... The people of Israel were a slave nation almost under the the oppressive boot of the Roman Empire. And so many of them had rejected their Messiah. Not all of them by any means. Paul himself was a Jewish man. Certainly there were some who had embraced Jesus as their Messiah. But as a whole, the nation had rejected him. And it seemed like they were cast off or cursed. and, and, And the question arises in Paul's mind, well, what's going on here? Thinking maybe God has changed his mind about Israel. And maybe that means he's going to change his mind about me. Maybe Israel was once loved and now forgotten. And maybe that's going to be me someday. You know, Paul, you've made all these great promises. But if God didn't do it for Israel in the end, how do I know he's going to do it for me? This is this question Paul's going to discuss over the next three weeks that we take a look in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. What about Israel? Does, does God's dealing with them comfort us or discourage us about God's dealings with us? Look at how he begins the chapter, verse 1. I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? What a contrast between the end of chapter 8 and the beginning of chapter 9. Well, Paul, what has you so upset? What has you so concerned? What's the source of continual grief in your heart? And Paul tells us now in verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Oh, you catch his passion, don't you there? 
You see that this wasn't just something in Paul's mind. It was something deep, deep down in his heart. Paul is troubled. And what troubles him? Let me explain to you simply. Paul was troubled about a great thing. It was the salvation of his countrymen, the people of Israel. Paul looked at the people of Israel and he considered all the great privileges that God had bestowed upon them. As he says here, the glory, the covenants, the adoption, the giving of the law, all of that. And he says it's all the more tragic now that that they're rejecting their Messiah. It's all the more tragic that they seem cursed or perhaps even cast off by God. I want them to come to Jesus. I want them to come into the fullness of what God has for them. Paul was troubled about a great thing. You know, when I, when I think about the things that trouble me, or trouble most of us, they're usually not great things, are they? We're usually stressed out and worried and, and very much bothered over things that are fairly insignificant. I'll tell you a way to wipe out all of your smaller problems is put your focus on a bigger problem. And, and that's reaching lost people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the great passion for souls that Paul had gave him perspective. The the lesser things did not trouble him because he was troubled by a great thing. Paul lived a hard life. Persecution, shipwrecks, famine, great travels, uh, stabbed in the back by his own associates, traveling around everywhere in the midst of great circumstances of difficulty and hardship. Paul lived a hard life. He's not troubled about any of that. He's troubled that the that the people he knows and loves so much don't know Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said this. It puts it in wonderful perspective. He said, Get love for the souls of men, and then you will not be whining about a dead dog or a sick cat or the crotchets of a family and the little disturbances that John and Mary may make by their idle talk. You will be delivered from petty worries if you're concerned about the souls of men. Get your soul full of a great grief, and your little griefs will be driven out. Paul was troubled about a great thing, even to the point where he says, I could wish that I myself were accursed. Paul said, Lord, if it would somehow help to send me to hell to bring salvation to, to my countrymen, then Lord, do it. What a great heart Paul had. It's the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus who took the curse upon himself that we might be blessed. Now we're going to take a look at verse 6. But before we do, a quick thought at verse 5. Did you notice that there? What Paul says in verse 5? At the very end of the verse, he says, Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Did you realize that one of the most straightforward, clear, simple phrases that you'll find in the whole New Testament... The Apostle Paul says that Jesus is God, the eternally blessed God. Amen. That's Jesus. Do you grab a hold of that? Some of you may be mistaken about that. In other words, you you admire Jesus as a great teacher. You, You admire Jesus as someone who worked miracles or maybe as a noble martyr or a great example. You may have it as the motto of your life. What would Jesus do? Well, that's great, but it's not a full enough understanding of who Jesus is. He's God. He's God made man. And, and if you haven't come to that understanding yet, you've got to listen to what the Old Testament prophets said. They said that the Messiah would be God. You've got to listen to what Jesus said about himself. Jesus said that he was God. You've got to listen to what all the New Testament writers say about Jesus. They all say that he was God. Now, verse 6, Paul again is dealing with this issue about Israel. He says, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. You see, Paul thinks of someone looking at Israel and saying, God's word didn't come through for them. He didn't fulfill his promise to Israel because they missed the Messiah and now they seem to be cursed. How do I know that God will come through for me if his word didn't come through for Israel? And so right on the beginning in verse 6, Paul assures us that it wasn't that the word of God had no effect. Friends, it's this simple. God's word didn't fail Israel. Not one bit. God's word will not have been found to fail Israel, not one bit. You say, well, now, wait a minute, Paul. If God's word didn't fail Israel, then how come they're not all saved? Paul said, let me explain to you why. I'll spell out the issue for you. First of all, he says again in the middle of verse 6, 
For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. It almost sounds like a riddle, doesn't it? It's not that hard to understand when you realize what the meaning of the name Israel is. Actually, it has a couple similar meanings, but one of the aspects of the name Israel means governed by God. And Paul is making a play on this word here, Israel. He's basically saying they are not all governed by God who are descendants of Abraham. They're not all governed by God who are Israel. No, it's like like saying that not every churchgoer is a true Christian. That's what Paul's saying. You know, there's a distinction between those who are of ethnic Israel and those who are of believing Israel. He goes on in verse 7, he goes, Nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. You see, Abraham had two sons. One of them was chosen by God. One of them was not. One of them was the son of the flesh. One of them was the son of the promise. Isaac was the son of the promise. Ishmael was the son of the flesh. Paul's making it clear here that, that, listen, it's not just about having Abraham as a descendant. Abraham had two sons. One was of the flesh, but one was of the promise. God still has his children of promise. That's what Paul's communicating to us. God hasn't failed anybody. God still has his children of promise. Not all ethnic Israel is his child of promise. But you see, it's not about being a descendant of Abraham. It's about being a child of the promise. And again, Paul points this out by demonstrating that merely being the descendant of Abraham saves no one. You know, the rabbis in Paul's day used to teach that that was the case. The the rabbis in Paul's day, some of them taught that, that Abraham sat right at the gates of hell. And he would just sit there looking at all the people who went by. And if someone who was his descendant somehow by accident started walking into hell, he'd stop them and turn them around and send them up to heaven where they belonged. You see, in their thinking, that's all that mattered. That's all you needed to do to be saved was to be descended from Abraham. Paul's saying, no, that's not it at all. You see, salvation comes by trusting God's promise, not by your ancestry. Friends, not only is that true for Israel in Paul's day, it's true for us right now. You may thank God for your sainted grandmother or your praying mother or your godly heritage. That in itself doesn't save you. You need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's often been said, and rightly so, that there are no grandchildren in the kingdom of God, only children. You need to come and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ yourself. Salvation is by trusting God's promise, not by ancestry. And here's another example of this. Jacob and Esau. He already talked about Isaac and Ishmael. Look at verse 10. He says, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. I want you to notice a phrase there in verse 11. The phrase is, the purpose of God. Paul wants us to know that when it came down to the descendants of Abraham, God had a purpose, and so he chose Isaac instead of Ishmael. When it came down to the descendants of Isaac, because Isaac had two sons, twins. Twins sort of run in my family, I'm... I'm the brother of a twin sister. And so we both know what it's like to be twins. Matter of fact, my parents had two sets of twins in our family. And twins, most people think that they have some kind of common bond together. You know, that they just sort of think the same. It's nothing like that. Especially if you're fraternal twins, as as my sister and I were, obviously, brother and sister. Although you'd be surprised as we were growing up, how many people would come up to us and they'd look at us and here's brother and sister. And they well, we're twins. And they'd say, identical? (laughs) No. I'm a boy. She's a girl. Well, Jacob and Esau weren't identical twins either. 
They were fraternal twins. They, they were connected genetically just as close as brothers were, brother to brother, because they were different kinds of people. What's interesting is that God had a purpose in choosing one and not choosing the other. He chose Jacob. And you say, well, yes, I know why he chose Jacob. He chose Jacob because Jacob was a good man and Esau was a bad man. That's a great way to think until you read the Bible. Because when you read the book of Genesis, you'll find something out. They were both bad. Then why did God choose Jacob instead of Esau? He says right there in verse 11, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. Friends, here's the principle. Jacob and Esau show that God has a plan. He has a plan and he's working it out. It was in his plan to choose Jacob to be the one to carry on the covenant. That was his plan. And this is what God wants us to see in the big picture with Israel, and then in the small picture with yours and our lives. Here's the message of Paul in this passage. Why is Israel in the mess it's in? Because God has a plan. How could it be that they miss their Messiah, that they seem to be afflicted right now? Why? Because God has a plan. And he has a plan for you, too. He has a plan in your life. Now again, God's plan is often hard to figure out. There was a logical choice between Jacob and Esau. The logical choice was the older. You, you, you always pick the older in that culture. And Esau was older because he was born before Jacob. By the way, with me and my twin sister, she's older than I am. So I'm the little brother in the family. Uh, ten minutes after my sister. Well, with Jacob and Esau, there was an older and a younger. And in that respect, I want you to see that God didn't do the logical thing. God said, I'm going to pick the younger over the older. I'm going to pick him to be the one on top. Because the older shall serve the younger. And then if you notice, as it says right there in verse 13, it says, Jacob, I have loved, but Esau, I have hated. That's a stumbling point for many people. They say, well, that's not fair. It's not fair for God to say, Jacob I've loved and Esau I've hated. There's a story that one time a woman brought, brought that question, that objection to Charles Spurgeon. And she said, I can't understand why it says here that God hates Esau. I have a real problem with this text. And Spurgeon looked at her and says, well, you know, I have a real problem with it too. Except I can't figure out why it is that God loved Jacob. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really the bigger question, isn't it? Now, friends, what I want you to see, though, is as you look at how the Bible works this out, God was not on a vendetta against Esau. If you look at the life of Esau in the book of Genesis, from Genesis chapter 33 and Genesis chapter 36 especially, ask yourself the question, was Esau a cursed man or a blessed man? Esau was a very blessed man. God blessed him. But with a great home, with a great uh, prosperity, with, with, with a great living situation, but with a heart full of freeness and forgiveness towards Jacob. Esau was a blessed man. Then how can it be said that God hated him? He hated him in the sense that he didn't choose him for the covenant. Because there would be a covenant to pass on through their father Abraham and through Isaac, and it would be either Jacob or Esau. So God said, in regard to the covenant, Jacob I've loved and Esau I've hated. That's how I choose. You see, God hated Esau in regard to inheriting the covenant. Not in regard to blessing in this life or the next, but in regard to the covenant, yes, certainly. I choose you and I don't choose you. But friends, Something that we really need to grab a hold of when it comes down to God choosing. And this is a huge stumbling block for many people. This is where they get tripped up or confused. We need to understand that God never chooses on a whim. God always has a plan. Why was it Jacob? Why was it not Esau? It wasn't a whim. God didn't roll dice in heaven. God didn't say eeny, meeny, miny, mo. God had a reason, a plan for choosing Jacob. Now again, we say, oh, well, I can figure out his plan. It was because Jacob was good and Esau was bad. No, that's not it. 
Paul bends over backwards to make us know that that's not the case. He says very clearly here in verse 11 that the children not yet being born nor having done any good or evil. That's when God made the choice. And so we scratch our heads and we say, well, there has to be a reason. God, why, why did you choose? Why did you choose Jacob instead of Esau? Why? You can't figure it out. Now, think about the big decisions you've made in your life. Where you're going to live, where you're going to work, what church you're going to attend, all the rest of it. The big decisions you've made in your life, you've probably never made a single one of them for only one reason. Right? A big decision has a lot of reasons going into it. Some of them more important than others. But probably for any big decision you've made, there's probably five or six or ten different reasons why you've made that decision. Some of them are more important than others, but many different factors go into your making that decision. Friends, it's the same way with God's plan. When God chooses, there are many different factors that go into making His decision. It's not just one. And so we we look for clues in the life of Jacob and Esau. We say, well, listen, I know they were both bad, but at the same time, the Bible says that Jacob valued the birthright that God wanted to give. And Esau didn't value it because he sold it for a mess of pottage. You say, okay, well, Jacob valued it more, so that's why, well, that might be part of it, but it's only part. In the fullness... You can't understand all the reasons for God's plan. You can't understand all the reasons for his choosing. Maybe some of them he might shed a little light on one aspect of a reason or another aspect. But all in all, you can't understand the whole thing. And do you know why you can't? It's because he's God and you're not. It's really that simple, isn't it? If we could understand all of God's reasons, all of God's purposes behind His eternal plan, well, well then we would be on the same level as God, and, and we know we're not there. Friends, please remember that God never chooses capriciously. He never chooses on a whim. There's always a plan, and a loving plan behind His choices. Now, if God's making choices... Does that take our responsibility out of the equation? Okay, God, you just choose. I guess I just do nothing. You're either going to choose or not choose God, so there's no point in us doing anything, I suppose. No, Paul's going to attack this right here. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whomever I'll have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Well, if God's making all the choices, and he doesn't let me know all the reasons, then maybe God's unrighteous and all of this. No, no, certainly not. Instead, Paul brings up this quotation from the book of Exodus, where God says, I'll have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. Should we remind ourselves what mercy is? Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. You deserve to be punished. Mercy is withholding the punishment that you deserve. Withholding the penalty that you should pay. Think of a, of a man dragged into court, accused of a horrible crime. And the evidence is there, and the judge hears the evidence, and, and he assesses that the man's guilty, and that he should be put to death for his crime. And just as the, the judge is to pound his gavel, and to, to make the verdict down, just as he's to do that, the, the man's mother rushes in. And the mother of the accused man comes before the the, the judicial bench and she comes and she says, Your Honor, I plead for mercy for my son. Well, the judge looks back at the woman and and he says, "Uh, Ma'am, your son is guilty. He did this crime. He deserves to be punished. And, And the mother responds by simply saying, Your Honor, I didn't ask for justice. I asked for mercy. Well, and that's the difference, isn't it? If you deserve it, it's not mercy. If you deserve what's coming to you in the thing, then it isn't mercy. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Now, in light of that, do you understand that God is free to give mercy as he chooses? If God wants to give mercy here and decides not to show it over there, it's just up to God. God's not being unfair. 
God will never be less than fair with anyone. But he may decide to be more than fair with some as he chooses. Let me put it to you this way. Jesus spoke a parable in Matthew chapter 20. In that parable in Matthew chapter 20, it was about a man who went out to hire some day laborers. He went out the very beginning of the day and hired people to come to work at the crack of dawn, 6 o'clock. Then he knows I don't have enough workers. So he goes back at 10 o'clock. And he hires people at 10 o'clock. And he makes the, the, the hiring then. And, and all along, he's just telling people, I'll just pay you, what you what's right. Don't worry about it. I'll pay you what's right. So the guys who go to work at 6 o'clock say, well, I'll get a day's wage for this. The guys at 10 o'clock say, well, I don't know. Let's hope what he gives us. He still doesn't have enough guys, so he hires people at 1 o'clock. And then finally, he makes one last hiring at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And then it comes time for payday. At the end of the day, they pay them all. So the pay table's set up, and all the men come by. And the master specifically says, I want the men that I hired last to be first in line to get their pay. Oh, okay, great. So the guys who got hired at 3 o'clock come along. They come to the pay table, and you know what the paymaster gives them? A full day's wage. Well, they worked a couple of hours. They came at 3 o'clock, and they get a full day's wage. Now, you're one of the guys who got hired at 6 o'clock. What are you saying at the back of the line? Saying, oh, this is great. If the guys who started work at 3 o'clock got a full day's wage, I'm going to get two or three days' wages. You come up, you're one of the 6 o'clock people, you get your money, you open it up, and it's one day's wage. And you're angry. Now, why are you angry? Was the master unfair to you? No. Just he decided to be more generous to somebody else. This is all just back in Bible times, right? Oh, no. The same instinct of jealousy and resentment is in us today. Next time you're at work and they're passing out the paychecks, what if this were to happen? You open up your paycheck, and it's just your normal paycheck. Well, that's it. You know, that's what I work for. There it is right there. And, and the guy standing next to you, your, your, your friend, your coworker, he opens up, and there's his paycheck. It's just normal and everything. But what do you know? There's another check inside of his envelope, and it's a check for $5,000. And they just decided to give it to him. You are so happy for your coworker at that moment, aren't you? <laughs> no, you're not. You're not happy for them at all. You're angry. Why? Was your employer unfair with you? No. Nope. He just decided to be more than fair with somebody else. Well, God is perfectly free to do that. God is free to give mercy as he chooses. And no one is ever unfair for not giving mercy. He's going to go on with this principle here in verse 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I've raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Oh, do you remember in the book of Exodus, when God hardened Pharaoh's heart? If God hardened Pharaoh's heart, God was certainly free to do that. Oh, but let me remind you something about this. Don't take this in the wrong way. Don't think that that here's Pharaoh, nice and kind and full of love and compassion towards the Jewish people. And God came along and took his soft, warm, loving heart and he hardened it. It wasn't like that at all, was it? When God hardened Pharaoh's heart, God gave Pharaoh exactly what he wanted. God said, this is the direction you want to go, then I'll give it to you. Here's the principle that Pharaoh wanted a hard heart, and God gave it to him. And so if God chooses to do that, he's free to do it. If he chooses to do something else, he's free to do that. Look at how Paul emphasizes this point of God's great sovereignty here in verse 19. He says, you'll say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? You know, what can I do? How can God hold me accountable? He can do just whatever he wants, anytime he wants to. But if you notice here in verse 20, he says, Indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? You see, in verse 19, man is trying to evade his responsibility. Well, you know, if God's in control, if he has his old plan, if God's all master over everything, then nothing I need to do. He can't find fault with me. Then on the day of judgment, I'll just stand before God and say, well, it's just how you wanted it, God. 
There's your plan. I guess I don't have any responsibility. And Paul says, no, no, no. You see, friends, God's plan never takes away our responsibility. Paul says that it's disrespectful to even ask this question. He says, who are you to reply against God? He's the potter, you're the clay. And if the potter says, I can shape the vessel any way I want, and you're still responsible, then you say, okay. You see, sometimes we want to go to either end of the extreme. God is sovereign and has his plan and does everything. Therefore, I have no responsibility. And God, you just do whatever you want. That's one end of the extreme. The other end of the extreme is, well, you know, I'm in charge. And God, well, he's just a passive spectator. And I just do whatever I want. And, that, and God says no to that as well. The answer is simply this, is that God is sovereign. He has a plan. And he looks to you and he says, you have a responsibility to respond to my plan. To work in cooperation with it. Well, but God, I don't understand. I don't understand how, how your sovereignty and my responsibility work together. I, I don't get all of that, God. How, how does it all work? And God says, I never called you to understand it. I just called you to, to believe it, to live it. I'm the potter, you're the clay. Look at it here in verse 22. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. See, God's free to do what he pleases in this regard. Paul here speaks of vessels for destruction and vessels for glory. And many people, or some people I should say, have taken a very wrong idea from this passage. It's the idea that God chooses some to be vessels of glory, and that God himself prepares and determines other vessels for destruction. Here's a person, they're, they're born, and God ha- has the mark of destruction on their forehead before they're ever born. They're born, and they grow up, and God says, you know what? I've chosen you for hell. There's nothing you can do about it. <clears throat> Some people have that idea, and it's totally wrong. If you notice here, in verse 23, or excuse me, in verse 22, where Paul speaks of the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, friends, don't think that God prepared them for destruction. They prepare themselves. You don't need God's help to prepare you for destruction. You're quite able to do that on your own. It's it's not God who does it. Man prepares his own destruction. Do you remember when Jesus spoke about that day of accountability, that day of judgment, where people would stand before him and and he would say, Hey, you're blessed. I want you to rise and come and come into the presence of your father prepared from before the foundation of the world for you. You see, God God has prepared that for for those who go to heaven. But I want you to notice what he said to those who who will go to eternal separation. He says, go and go into the place, the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. God didn't prepare a place for that specific individual in the lake of fire. They prepared it themselves. And so, friends... When you ask me, why is a man saved? I'll say it's only due to the gracious, beautiful, choosing act of God who's worked in his life. You ask me, why is a man damned? It's because he chose it himself. And I won't lay it to God's door, the destruction or the damnation of that individual. Now notice here in this last section, beginning at verse 25. As he says also in Hosea, I'll call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You're not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. God can choose to do that as He pleases. And then He says in Isaiah, here, verse 27, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved, for He will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Saboeth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, and we would be made like Gomorrah. Both of these quotations from Hosea and Isaiah show us that God has a plan that he's working out. You know that he has a plan. 
He worked it out in Israel. He works it out through his remnant. He works it out through his work in individual lives. God's plan is being worked out. So they ask the question, why is Israel in the place that it's in? It's because God has a plan. But remember this, and look especially at the end part of verse 29. He says, unless the Lord of Seboeth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. You see, Sodom and Gomorrah were completely destroyed in judgment. But God says that unless he would have intervened, we would have been completely destroyed. Friends, this is what I want you to grab a hold of. It's true that God has a plan, but his plan is merciful and good. He rescues. If it weren't for his loving plan, we would have all been completely destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. But because his plan is merciful and good, God extends his goodness towards us in that plan. Some of you need help believing that this morning. Oh, I suppose for some of you, your problem is that you have a hard time remembering that God has a plan. You just forget about it. You live your life as if, as if God was very distant and He had no plan for your life. Understand that God has a plan for your life. He always has a plan. But friends, others of you, you know God has a plan. You're just not convinced that it's good and merciful for you. You wonder if God doesn't have it out for you. No, God, God has a merciful and good plan for your life. And it all begins with what Jesus accomplished at the cross. So we're going to take communion right now and remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. And if you need a reminder this morning about God's plan and how merciful and good it is, pay special attention to the voice of the Lord in you at communion. Because He wants to speak to you about His merciful and good plan. Let me pray right now and ask that the Lord prepares our hearts just for that. Father... We recognize that you have a plan. And Lord, as well, we realize that your plan is merciful and good. You needed no special plan for us to be destroyed. Lord, we're capable of doing that ourselves. But but your mercy and goodness has extended to us a plan whereby we can be saved in Jesus Christ and find hope and security and peace for today. Lord, I pray that you would persuade us, not just that you have a plan, but that it is good and merciful on our behalf. Do that this morning, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.